The existence of capital punishment has basically been around since the beginning of time. It's taken many different forms over the centuries, but the general idea has stayed the same. And the question of its moral and ethical value in modern day society has been a significant point of contention, specifically in the West. In the United States alone, 27 states still support capital punishment under various circumstances. But this shouldn't really come as a surprise. A major text that Western civilization is built around, the Bible contains its fair share of capital punishment too. And if the most valued religious text in the West permitted such an act back then, it must be permissible for us today, right? All one need do is read a few pages of the Old Testament to realize that Yahweh himself often demanded executions and genocides as a way to clear the path for a single people group. However, an equally strange point is that the New Testament characters, including Jesus and the Apostle Paul, never mentioned the immoral act of executing someone. Even when Jesus was crucified, he never suggested that the Roman method of crucifixion itself was morally reprehensible. There didn't appear to be any question of the validity of capital punishment by the Son of God himself at all. But that's a discussion for another time. I just find that small detail somewhat compelling. One is free to interpret these biblical events as they wish, but the reality is still there. Capital punishment is often justified under the guise of divine justice. And often, there's no way to push back against this because, well, if God did it, then God must approve of us doing it too. This has been the traditional Christian understanding for almost two millennia. The traditional Christian's understanding of the Bible, albeit incorrectly, in my view, is that the vast majority of the human race will consciously suffer for all eternity for not accepting Jesus Christ as their savior. Unbelief, according to many Christians, is the worst possible crime, which comes with the most severe penalty. And if eternal conscious torment is not the pinnacle of capital punishment, then I really don't know what is. Now, I don't mean to bash people's worldviews. I didn't bring up Christianity just to smash it to smithereens. My point is that the West specifically is dealing with the question of capital punishment because one of its founding texts supported it. And let's be honest, many individuals in the Western world still support capital punishment. We could pursue the implications of such a place that torments human beings for all eternity, i.e. hell, but it's not within the scope of this video. However, I'll be returning to the asymmetry between a crime and its consequences toward the end. What I would like to pin down right now, though, is Albert Camus' view on capital punishment, or more specifically, his thoughts on the guillotine. It's important to understand Camus' point in time as it relates to the use of the guillotine. His now famous essay, Reflections on the Guillotine, was published in 1957 just three years before Camus was killed in a car accident. It would be another 24 years from the publication of the essay, 1981, that France would officially ban the use of the guillotine. This is kind of incredible to think about. The guillotine wasn't banned until 1981. France was still legally able to execute people using the guillotine right up until Joan Jett came out with the hit song, I Love Rock and Roll. I don't know, maybe I'm the only one who thinks that's insane. Of course, the guillotine was used for the last time in 1977. But during Camus' time, the guillotine was still widely used, and the executions were not witnessed in the public square as they had in times past. This was just one of the many problems Camus saw with the whole endeavor. The guillotine in the beginning had a specific purpose, or so it seemed. And that was, according to a representative of the people in 1791, to hold the people in check. The goal of the guillotine was to hold people in check. The goal of public executions was to scare the tar out of folks who might be contemplating committing a serious crime. In other words, it was to function as a deterrent. But how can an execution function as a deterrent if people aren't allowed to witness it, as was the case in Camus' time? Well, we'll get to that, but first, a small note about the advent of the guillotine itself. There was another reason for the invention of the guillotine. It was supposed to be a more humane method of execution than the methods used in the past, such as a sword or axe, which often failed to sever the head from the body. Dr. Joseph Guillotine in 1789 suggested to the French government that they ought to consider a gentler method of execution. Guillotine argued that a lightning-quick method for executing criminals, or those even accused of crimes, would be more egalitarian than other methods. Dr. Guillotine eventually oversaw the development of the first prototype of the machine that would, to his regret, take his name, accompanied by the French doctor Antoine Louise and built by a German harpsichord maker named Tobias Schmidt. And so it was, the first execution by Guillotine was, 
um, executed in April of 1792. Now, back to Camus' beef with the guillotine. One issue he noticed was that executions were no longer made visually available to the public. They no longer took place in the public square, thereby negating the original justification for the development of the machine. Not only this, but it really wasn't discussed. The guillotine was more of an open secret in French society than anything. Camus writes, People write of capital punishment as if they were whispering. In our well-policed society, we recognize that an illness is serious from the fact that we don't dare speak of it directly. For a long time, in middle-class families, people said no more than that the elder daughter had a suspicious cough, or that the father had a growth because tuberculosis and cancer were looked upon as somewhat shameful maladies. This is probably even truer of capital punishment, since everyone strives to refer to it only through euphemisms. Camus continues by noting that France, along with England and Spain, was one of the only countries to have the honor of maintaining capital punishment in its arsenal of repression. The French Algerian continues, The survival of such a primitive right, or capital punishment, has been made possible among us only by the thoughtlessness or ignorance of the public, which reacts only with the ceremonial phrases that have been drilled into it. When the imagination sleeps, words are emptied of their meaning. A deaf population absent-mindedly registers the condemnation of a man. But if people are shown the machine, made to touch the wood and steel and to hear the sound of a head falling, then public imagination, suddenly awakened, will repudiate both the vocabulary and the penalty. It's obvious that Camus, as a public intellectual and journalist, had given this subject a fair bit of thought, but he didn't solely rely on intellectual reflection. He also had the privilege of indirect experience with capital punishment. At the beginning of the essay, he draws out his father's experience of attending a public execution in 1914. Though his father never said anything about it, Camus' mother shared some of the details of what happened after Camus' father returned home from the event. Here's a snippet of that story. Shortly before the War of 1914, an assassin whose crime was particularly repulsive, he had slaughtered a family of farmers, including the children, was condemned to death in Algiers. He was a farm worker who had killed in a sort of bloodthirsty frenzy, but had aggravated his case by robbing his victims. The affair created a great stir. It was generally thought that decapitation was too mild a punishment for such a monster. This was the opinion I have been told of my father, who was especially aroused by the murder of the children. One of the few things I know about him, in any case, is that he wanted to witness the execution for the first time in his life. He got up in the dark to go to the place of execution at the other end of town amid a great crowd of people. What he saw that morning, he never told anyone. My mother relates merely that he came rushing home, his face distorted, refused to talk, lay down for a moment on the bed, and suddenly began to vomit. I have to admit that I would very likely have had the same response as Camus' father. The prospect of watching someone be killed right before my eyes is deeply unsettling. And this is perhaps why the French government started executing people behind closed doors. And it's also likely why in America, we apply lethal injection away from the public view. But this raises a series of important questions. If state-sponsored execution is moral and just, then why is the event concealed from the public view? Why is it that the public doesn't have access to this so-called moral and just act? Why isn't it streamed on Netflix, or shared on YouTube, or nationally televised? I have no idea if there is a Black Mirror episode on this subject, but I wouldn't be surprised if there was. The answer appears pretty obvious as to why none of this happens. It's because none of it actually is moral or just. It appears that the act of murder isn't the key element in question anyway. It's a matter of who commits the act of murder that makes all the difference. A civilian can murder another civilian, which is considered a death-worthy crime. But the state can, and often does, do the same thing, and it's affectionately referred to as justice. This asymmetry didn't really sit well with Camus, and it doesn't really sit well with me. But the situation gets worse. Before we move on, I would like to reiterate the initial function of capital punishment in France, and specifically the guillotine. It was originally sold as a way to keep the population in check. Keep this small detail in mind. Now, we have to consider the specific individuals who carried out these executions in France during Camus' time. Were they paid government officials, criminals themselves, or something else entirely? Camus writes, they, the executioners, seem less exceptional when we learn that hundreds of persons offer to serve as executioners without pay. 
The men of our generation who have lived through the history of recent years, World War II specifically, will not be astonished by this bit of information. They know that behind the most peaceful and familiar faces slumbers the impulse to torture and murder. The punishment that aims to intimidate an unknown murderer certainly confers a vocation of killer on many another monster about whom there is no doubt. And since we are busy justifying our cruelest laws with probable considerations, let there be no doubt that out of those hundreds of men whose services were declined, one at least must have satisfied otherwise the bloodthirsty instincts the guillotine excited in him." Close quote. This is a really interesting point. Not only did the French government welcome volunteers for the job of executioner, but it turned away many of them. One has to wonder what the mental disposition had to have been of someone who was willing to execute people without pay, much less with pay. And Camus is right. Of those who were turned away from this so-called community service, surely some of them turned into murderers themselves in order to satisfy whatever depraved craving that ignited their interest in executing people in the first place. A poetic flourish on the subject could go as follows. A murderer is merely an unhired executioner. Even more than the state-sponsored individual who executes criminals, Camus was bothered by the waiting period that comes after someone has been sentenced to death. He notes that the ones sentenced often had to wait several months before they faced their death. And the same is true today in America. If anyone has experienced severe panic or anxiety, you'll know that the panic and anxiety are often much, much worse than the thing panicked about. This has certainly been the case in my own life. And Camus recognized this. Yes, of course, the penalty for killing someone in France during that time was getting your head chopped off. But the real torture, the thing that truly annihilated the guilty party, was the waiting period before that fateful act. Camus' short novel, The Stranger, goes into a bit of this waiting period. But that's for another time. Camus doesn't argue that murder shouldn't be repaid with execution. He even admits that, quote, it is just and necessary to compensate for the murder of the victim by the death of the murderer. But beheading is simply not death. Close quote. And the evidence that Camus leans on here is the waiting period leading up to death. There's something of a second order punishment happening there. And for anyone who believes that all punishment must fit the crime, there's no punishment that fits the crime of psychologically torturing someone that has already been sentenced to death. And we now come full circle to the topic mentioned at the beginning of this episode. In the Western world, the Bible has been appealed to in certain situations, including justice and death. In fact, the traditional Christian view of hell is the quintessential example of a punishment not fitting the crime. And it's this strain of vengeance and revenge that has overtaken our commitment to justice. No matter what crime an individual has committed in his or her life, none of it could rationally require eternal conscious torment. The Western world, and the rest of the world for that matter, has shared a lineage of over-punishing the guilty. And this is precisely what Camus was arguing against. For the French Algerian, if the world has any hope of ushering in a truly humane existence, it must start with the way we treat the guilty. Vengeance and revenge can no longer cover for what we really should be aiming for, which is justice. Now, the question of justice and how we understand that term is a good subject for debate. However, we can know a little bit more about justice by defining what it isn't, which includes vengeance and a desire to heighten suffering. If you enjoyed this video, consider subscribing to this channel, smashing the thumbs up, and hitting that notification bell. And if you'd like more content like this, consider supporting me through Patreon or just engaging with me on Instagram. And until next time, cheers.